Namaste. Well, somebody left a comment this morning that woke me up to a huge issue in most people's lives, and that is the issue of where is the money coming from? How am I going to live? How am I going to buy groceries, pay my rent, get my car <laughs> out of the shop, <laughs> whatever? You know, I forget because I've been retired for, what, 24 years now. I have a Kali Yuga brain here, you know. I forget how much of a hassle it is to have to work for a living and how much it interferes with your sadhana. I mean, yeah, it's a huge issue. That's why more people don't come and visit me and stuff. They can't take the time off. They don't have the money. So, herb tea. I have to tell you my story. I mean, you know, I could pull the whole... I was born in a log cabin in the foothills of the Ozarks in West Tennessee, and my name is a Rocky Raccoon. But I'm not going to do that. Actually, I was born in the deep south, Florida. Florida at that time was not a vacation destination. It was not you know, the international headquarters of the Church of Scientology <laughs> and Disneyland and whatever. It was cotton country. It was slave country. It was deeply red, conservative place. And uh, that's where my mother had me, and that's where I was born. And the first uh, year and a half or two years of my life, I had a wet nurse, a black lady, and uh, she would literally, you know, feed me her breast milk because her baby died. And uh, she's the one who really formed my musical taste because she used to sing, you know, all these old blues songs and spirituals and stuff. I remembered this in, you know, in uh, intensive therapy primal scream therapy. So anyway, all good things come to an end, and my mother decided to go back to New York to her mother, uh, who had just bought a house in New Jersey in the suburbs, and there was enough room for everybody, you know, even me. <laughs> so in other words, um, I was born in a kind of dysfunctional, lower middle class family, household. But you know what? We always had enough to eat. And there was even money for hobbies and toys and stuff like that. So I can't say I was deprived. Actually, I had a wonderful childhood. I was in Jupiter Mahadash at the time. And since I have Jupiter in Scorpio, I was always getting in trouble. <laughs> for being too dumb, too smart, too this, too that. I go to extremes because I have Mars exalted in my birth chart. So anyway, um, once I escaped from school, <laughs> I mean, literally, you know, I mean, my idea of fun was uh, cutting school at 11 o'clock, taking the bus into, into Manhattan and having lunch at the Playboy Club with these quants, these mathematicians who also were musicians and had a recorder ensemble. And we used to meet at the Playboy Club and then go and uh, jam. Wild days, wild. And then I put myself through music school, Montclair Conservatory in Montclair, New Jersey. I got to study with some really, you know, professional, highly trained musicians. Gave me a foundation that could have taken me anywhere. Um, but what actually happened is I got really sick of the whole music business scene and uh, went to the West Coast, became a hippie, became an independent session musician, um, 
flute and woodwinds and drums, hand drums and like that. And um, it was in that period that I was living in a place where there were many musicians and lots of gurus came through because, you know, if you have a famous musician as your disciple, that can really set you up, right? So all these guys used to come and um, I got to meet most of them. They stayed in my friend's house, Bob Schneff, uh, the artist, the poster artist. Look him up on Google Image. He's done some cool stuff. But anyway, I met all these gurus, but none of them were like, you know, my guru. So I was studying Indian music with Ali Akbar Khan, the sarodist. And um, he is the guru by the, the guru brother of Ravi Shankar. So he's at that level. Only he's not as famous, you know, because he didn't want to be. <laughs> He would rather play fine music than show off like Ravi. So anyway, I was studying with him, Indian music, and um, Rasa Tattva, the science of transcendental emotions. And uh, he said to me one day, you know, Dave, you're not cut out to be a touring concert professional musician. Your heart is too soft. You know, you just don't have the kind of personality that would thrive in that environment. You know what you should do? You should become a temple musician, a sacred musician, and play ragas for God. I said, ragas for God? Well, that sounds pretty good, but, you know, I don't really know anything about that. I'm a jazz musician, you know, do bop, scoo bop, do wah. And what would I do there, you know? Well, he said, look, don't worry about it. I'll introduce you to my dear friend from childhood, from Kolkata, and he can teach you everything you need to know. Okay. So we went into San Francisco, and we met with Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And he became, over some time, over some period of time, <laughs> he became my Diksha Guru, Shiksha Guru, and initiated me in the mantras and the Sanskrit and so many other things. So, what does this have to do with making money? Everything. Because up until that time, I was, you know, gloriously, hippily, groovily, stonedly uh, impoverished. And even though, you know, I knew a lot of hip people and stuff, you know, it didn't, didn't do anything for my bank balance. <laughs> Why? Now that I look back, it's clear. Why was I born in a family that uh, couldn't bequeath any estate to me for one reason or another? Why was I educated in really a glorified teacher's school? Most of the people who graduated from there became teachers, de facto. It was a teacher's college. Uh, yes, I got a good musical training, but, you know, it was probably not enough to get me to the top, because, especially because I didn't have the connections, the personal relationships. But anyway, I was not set up I was not born with a silver spoon. I did not get a big break and become famous or anything like that. And it was probably not going to happen. So, especially since now I know astrology and I look at my birth chart and it's just like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> I was set up, totally set up to be a sadhu, to go into Vedic life and temple life and all that. And I did. I went back and forth from India to the U.S. And when I was in India, I'd live in temples and study the Vedas and practice the stuff. And when I came home, I had founded or created a technical writing business. And so I would make enough money to coast for a while, since I was expert at that. 
<laughs> and I would go to India. You know, I mean, the thousand bucks or so it costs to go to India was more than made up by the fact that I had the run of my guru's temples and I could pretty much do anything I wanted to and did. But that was how I got through my early days, my formative days. I didn't have much economic prospects. But then after my guru passed away, I came back for an extended stay in the U.S. and I built my business up by delivering a very quality product on time, under budget, you know, all that good stuff, under promising and over delivering. <laughs> Why does that matter? Why is this context important? Because that was the turning point in my life. That's when I went from a hand-to-mouth existence as, you know, an artist and this and that to a respected professional. And I worked my business for over 25 years. And I had a good accountant who paid my taxes. And when I reached retirement age, actually even before I reached Social Security retirement age, uh, I retired. I retired and I just bummed around with hippies for two or three, maybe four years. <laughs> I had an adventure. It was great. More than made up for the nose to the grindstone, uh, you know, uh, to save up for retirement. But I did save up for retirement. What made the difference was that in serving my spiritual master, I was serving God. And we were always doing mantras, pujas, yajnas, Vedic sacrifice, where you create a sacred fire and then you offer things into the sacred fire, thinking of it as God's mouth and so on, with many, many mantras. And it. it's really cool. It's a science. The science of creating good karma. So the result of this good karma is ka -ching, money, wealth, fame, as much as you need to make you wealth and then to do your seva, your service. I don't know how many people I tell this and they don't believe me. This is crazy. Even though it's stated right in the Vedas, the purpose of the Vedic sacrifices from the smallest, you know, simplest little ritual all the way up to, you know, like Ashvamedha Jagna, which can only be offered by the emperor of the world huh? and costs more than the GDP of, you know, North America to hold. The purpose of all these is to generate wealth. Why? You need wealth to have leisure, and you need leisure to do sadhana. You need to be able to drop out. You need to be able to re retire or go on extended vacation and live in temples and serve your guru and study the Vedas without any distractions completely focused, completely immersed. And just like learning a language, you know, the best way to learn any language is to go to the country where it's spoken. And I've been to so many countries, and so far I have completely failed to learn any language, except Sanskrit, and a little bit of Bengali, and a little bit of Pali, all for the purpose of sacred texts, studying the sacred texts. So anyway, you have to work a job, you're sick and tired of it, working like a dog to make some fat, greedy, rich guy richer. Uh, are you tired of that yet? Are you done with that yet? Well, start doing Vedic Jagna, Karma Yoga, sacrifices, offering your food, quitting intoxication and other things like that. And over time, the results will accrue. 
and you will be financially stable and independent. That is my experience. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>